Whoa, buddy. Put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. What more could you want from a low-budget radio program? This is a dumpster fire. That was just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show, streaming live across the world. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukesShow.com and across the state of Alaska on this, your favorite radio station and or FM translator. Hello, good morning to you, my friends. How are you? How are you? Are you ready? Are you ready for that beautiful, that it's Thursday. Thursday, my friends. That uh, beautiful day of the week, right before Firearms Friday. Oh, man. Uh, we are ready. Ready to go. Ready to dive in and uh, get everything uh, get everything going on and do our stuff. It's uh, just one of those beautiful days. Ready to go. Uh, we are uh, going to dive into it here in just a few minutes. Uh, we're waiting for uh, our first guest of the show today, who is going to be J.D. Tuchili from Reason Magazine, who's going to come on board and talk with us uh, um, about, well, about something that um, most business owners in uh, and in the country should hear about, um, a federal law law that you've probably never that could hmm, a lot even though it has been ruled unconstitutional you i mean this we you can't make this stuff up folks you cannot make this stuff up it is uh it's it's some crazy crazy stuff if you're a business owner or if you know a business owner you should make sure that you go back and share the show with them today tell them to listen to the podcast because as a business owner, um, this this show is a corporation. Um, I was a little shocked. I've been hearing about this, and uh, it's important. So we're going to talk to JD Two Chili here in just a hot second, and get the straight scoop on that. Uh, then the remainder of the show, we've got some headlines. Uh, I think we're going to do a little bit of a what if segment. We haven't done that in a while, um, and I was actually <clears throat> because I'm traveling today up and down the highway in Alaska in the middle of winter, I was going through my, I was going through my emergency kit in my car, uh, and my little, my little get home bag. Uh, and I was looking through some stuff and I was updating a few things and I thought this would be a good discussion. We should talk about that because we do a lot of traveling and, um, you know, sometimes I think it's just easy to forget. We get complacent. And so an hour or two, we'll probably do a segment or two on, um, you know, the what if kind of emergency kit for your car in case you break down or something's going on or your get home bag if something happens um, where you need to make sure you get home. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll probably talk about that as well uh, with some headlines or whatever else. Well, the phone lines will be open. We're going to throw it all in there. We're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's uh, that's where we are today. And uh, I see that JD is now in the green room hanging out with us, ready to go. And we will uh, we'll dive into this and uh, get uh, get started this morning on this most. This is an interesting take, and again, um, on a law that if you're a business owner, you are probably required to comply to uh, and comply with. But you probably have no idea what we're about to talk about. JD Tuchelli joins us. He is a senior contributing editor for Reason Magazine. And he uh, is, of course, also has his weekly newsletter, which if you don't subscribe, you're dead to me. If you don't subscribe to his weekly newsletter, you're dead to me uh, because it is uh, fantastic. It's called The Rattler, and it gives you all the good stuff uh, that he prints out and produces every week. J.D. Tuchilli joins us this morning uh, for conversations and more. Good morning, my friend. How are you this morning? 
Doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Well, as always, it's my pleasure to have you on. It's, uh, you know, it's it's super easy for me to call you or Eric or uh, Jacob or somebody and have you guys on because you're always writing such good stuff over there uh, at Reason. And uh, I really appreciate it. So, you know, I've been hearing about this. You've actually written about this several times before. It's obviously something you're passionate about. But your latest headline just got to me. The headline reads, Feds enforcing unconstitutional reporting law against most businesses with a subheadline that says, are you in compliance with the Corporate Transparency Act? Have you even heard of it? And I would say that the answer to that is probably a 95 plus percent no. Uh, do you think I'm wrong? Give me give me give me the details here, J.D. This is a federal law that was passed in uh, 2021, and it went into effect at the beginning of this year. Starting um, Enforcement started on January 1st. Um, it applies to um, limited liability companies, S&C corporations, with 20 or fewer, 20 or fewer, not big companies, uh, employees. So you're talking about small businesses, um, Etsy's, you know, Etsy vendors, storefronts, um, I've got a couple of them myself. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have them set up to uh, ease uh, small businesses and uh, and uh, some commercial re real estate investment we've made. And um, small companies, of course, don't have much in the way of regulatory compliance apparatus. Why would you? You're working out of your house. And Are you this, this is a big you don't, deal. You don't, you don't have a legal department in your corporation? Is that what you're saying? Shockingly, you no. <laughs> and few of us do. So it's a big deal This that this kind of a stealth law and the National Small Business Association has been warning against this law for a while, as has the American Institute of uh, Certified Public Accountants, um, is kind of dropped and is now applying as of January 1st of this year. And it, it requires all of these uh, small companies, these LLCs and S corporations, what have you, to report what's called beneficial ownership information, basically stakeholder information to the federal government, FinCEN, that's the enforcement branch of the Department of the Treasury. And they have to do so by January 1st, 2025, or if you're incorporated after that date, within 30 days of uh, the creation of the, of the new corporation. It kind of centralizes a reporting for small business to the federal government, because traditionally this is a state function. It adds a regulatory burden on top of um, one that it's already there in terms of due diligence to banks. You have to report this information already to the banks you deal with. Um, and it can get you in a lot of trouble. There's up to two years um, in prison um, for those who don't uh, comply with this law. And there's a $500 per day fine. I think it's up to $10,000 capped, uh, which is a lot of money, especially since we're talking about small businesses. Um, and what's, what's the real kicker is that this law has already been ruled unconstitutional but you still have to comply with it unless you're a member of the Small Business Association or an associated plaintiff named Isaac Winkles of Alabama. So time right now to scroll over to the National Business Association and sign up right now. Just pay the fee and get it done to make sure you're, I mean, this is crazy. Uh, now this is all ostensibly to prevent terrorism, right? I mean, that's what this is all about, supposedly, is Feinstein wants to know who all the principals are in every corporation uh, to prevent money laundering and criminal activities and terrorism and all this other kind of stuff. But the problem is, of course, they haven't really told anybody, but there's been no massive. The only place I've actually even read about this act is in reason. That's the only place I've ever seen an actual commentary about it. And you actually say many accountants are, are, being surprised to discover this. They didn't know, even know about it. Yeah, my accountant sent out a notice two days before Christmas, which I'm taking as a, whoops, I forgot this was coming or I just learned this is coming notification. Another accountant I deal with has not sent out a notification and told me she was waiting on the outcome of the litigation. Maybe she was, or maybe she got a heads up on this from me. I don't know. But uh, there is still this year to get the, the compliance done. But really, I mean, the National Small Business Association and the American Institute of, Certifi of CPAs has been warning that nobody knows this is on the way. And the only place I could find much coverage of this was in accounting journals. So, I mean, this is not something that's on the public radar, but it has huge stakes. And yeah, it was justified with this laundry list of financial horribles, um, money laundering, uh, human trafficking, tax evasion. I think tax evasion was probably the big motivation here. 
small some small businesses a lot of them deal with cash and the irs has never been happy with small businesses because they're all they're all scurrying around they're hard to herd and uh, they're relatively non-compliant compared to a big corporation which will give you the money when you lean on them hard enough so well, um and this yeah and this they, is really they, used to target llc's and small business people yeah and they make up something like 80 plus percent of all businesses are small businesses and so they're seeing a big slice of that pie out there that they're oh we're not getting our cut of that and so they're worried about it um the the onerousness of this is very very troubling again you've already pointed out this information is already out there uh, the states have it because it's a state the state takes care of it it's a state issue the state incorporates these these people uh, or helps them form the LLC or whatever. Um, the banks have it already. And so this is like this multiple, and you, and I don't think you mentioned it in this article, but it was a previous article. You said that the form that you have to fill out for the CTA is this amorphous, huge, all this information. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, this is crazy, JD. And again, it's already been ruled unconstitutional. And yet they're going to proceed ahead and just like nothing's happened here. And that's exactly it. I mean, the reporting on this, the, the compliance on this is going to be a real haul. You're going to have to go, small business are going to have to go to their accountants, assuming they have accountants. A lot of people don't. They do this themselves because up until now, their business affairs have been relatively straightforward and simple. Um, what I didn't put in that article, because I found it after the fact, a, a couple of accountants contacted me and told me that because this requirement comes through the Treasury Department, through FinCEN, they're not sure they're allowed to, to uh, do the compliance on this for the businesses that they serve as clients. They might be opening themselves up to charges of serving as unlicensed attorneys if they do so. The real compliance may have to come from a lawyer. A lot of lawyers aren't familiar with this. It's a new requirement that it hasn't been on their radar. It's been on the accounting radar to the extent that's been on anybody's radar. So this is going to be a big uphill slog. And yes, a federal judge ruled this unconstitutional. He looked at it and he said, maybe this is a justified bill. Maybe you need it. He says, but there's actually no justification in this for, for invoking federal authority. He says there needs to be some kind of a nexus to federal jurisdiction because this is really a state level function. And so the feds have to invoke something. And he said, and we usually recognize a, an invocation of the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. He says there wasn't even a hand wave in that direction. There's no pretense of constitutionality. They just assumed that the federal government has authority that it doesn't necessarily have. And so he says this bill is unconstitutional, and he didn't even have to go to the objections on First and Fourth Amendment grounds that had been raised by the plaintiffs, because it was plainly unconstitutional as an exercise of power beyond the federal government's jurisdiction. Nevertheless, FinCEN says the only people that, that they're excluding from enforcement are members of the National Small Business Association and the plaintiff and the other plaintiff in this case, an individual named Isaac Winkles. So uh, the rest of us are still subject to a law that the federal court said is unconstitutional. Again, it's making me just want to dial right over to Google and figure out how to join this National Small Business Association just to avoid all the problems with this. Because, again, this and, and this is the problem with with the federal government and overreach and things like this, especially on small business. We're already burdened with mountains of compliance. Um, you know, and again, this affects LLCs, S Corps, C Corps, anybody like that. Now, not sole proprietorships, but everything else. That is under 20 employees, which I would imagine makes up the lion's share of every SC Corp or LLC. I mean, it's just that's just probably how it works. And it's just, again, another governmental overreach that throws the burden on you having to do it uh, without the, you know, again, they exempted all the large corporations. I mean, why? Well, maybe because the information is already there and it's they just go or is it because they hate small business? I mean, I, I can't think of any other reason why they would exempt the large ones. I mean, the, the, there really is no good reason. I mean, they claim it's because terrorists and drug traffickers or whatever are using LLCs and S corps to launder money. Well, maybe. I mean, they do is a lot of things. And if you make this particular path hard for criminals and terrorists to launder money through, 
they'll do something else that's more explicitly illegal. Um, small business owners are trying to stay at least within spitting distance of compliance of the law because they don't want trouble. So they're the ones you don't want, you know, who, who are least likely to be in violation. So you're going to go after some fraction of a percent of bad, you know, of malefactors who actually meet the definition of terrorists and money launderers in order to, you know, and, and by doing so, you're going to inconvenience the vast number of, uh, of honest small business owners, which is ludicrous. Yeah. But the fact yeah. is the government does not like small businesses. They're hard to hurt, as I mentioned before. They're hard to bring into compliance because there's so many of them. And they don't work with the government with the, through their compliance departments because they don't have compliance departments the way mid to a large size companies do. Yeah. Regulatory capture is what Brian says in the chat room. That's exactly what it is. It's regulatory capture. And, of course, again, it is that big slice of the pie that they want to make sure that they have access to. Um, and I think that's really what it comes down to. JD Tuchilli is our guest uh, from Reason Magazine. We're talking about the CTA, the Corporate Transparency Act, which sounds fancy and sounds like it should only apply to people like Google or whatever. But if you own a small business, it more than likely applies to you. And we're going to continue to discuss this and then we'll get the latest from JT on other things as well. The Michael Duke Show continues. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Running on 100% pure beard power. Oh, also some coffee we dip our beard in coffee ha, nice beard the michael duke show all right jd to chili our guest just he and me with a beard power we're beard we're beard powering it today um <clears throat> yeah jd I, again i was reading about this and i and i the first time you put you brought it up and i was like what I, I mean, I hadn't even heard it. I hadn't seen, I didn't get an email. I didn't get a, a message. I didn't get anything from, uh, from my, my account. And I do have an account. Uh, I did my own taxes for years personally and all that kind of stuff. But with all the nonsense in 2021 and 22 and whatever, I had to get, a, I had to get a personal accountant for my taxes because they made it so complicated for my family. But when I started my business, I'm like, there is no way that I'm even going to attempt to try that because the, the thing that scares people the most is getting sideways with the government. And if you're a business, especially you, I mean, that terrifies you because you just don't even know you could make one mistake. And cause you hear the stories, the horror stories, one mistake, and they screw you through the floor uh, and you're done and, and everything else. And so I always had an accountant, which of course is an added expense and everything else. But the, I mean, even my accountants have not said a single thing about this. And that really spooks me. I think this rule snuck up on a lot of accountants. I mean, again, there's been a few uh, articles about it in accounting journals, but unless your accountant's pretty savvy, um, it's easy for something like this to slide under the radar because it's a weird requirement for the federal government to impose on small businesses. Um, it's it's an exercise of authority that you traditionally haven't seen. States regulate uh, small corporations, not the federal government. So for FinCEN to start to uh, jump in, and FinCEN is you know the big scary any anti money money laundering agency that runs through the treasury, and now they're chasing down vendors and cottage food businesses and trying to squeeze them for ownership information. Who do you think owns it? I mean, it's ridiculous. And right. the compliance costs on this are going to be insane, which when it's backed up by two years in prison and 500 bucks a day, um, I mean, you're going to milk the average cottage food business for 500 bucks a day because they missed the deadline and a rule they never heard of. I mean, this is going to be brutal. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, so the Corporate Transparency Act, uh, Rick says, will this affect some larger farms also? Well, it depends, Rick. Do you Is your farm set up as an LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp with less than 20 employees? Because that's who that's who's affected. Millions of businesses will be affected and nobody's heard about it. That, that's the other thing. It, it's not like they put out a, a multi-million dollar public ad campaign to say, do you own a small business? You need to report to the C, for the CTA. I mean, nobody nobody has heard of it. Uh, and, I, and I guess they're just assuming that the accountants will do it. But as you said, some accountants are now saying, we're not sure we can even legally do that because we're not attorneys and it might require an attorney. I mean, 
the it in for for something that's already available for information that's already available uh, for information that the state is already taking care of, as the judge pointed out in that ruling, the state this is a state's responsibility. Why is FineSend getting involved in this? I mean, they should be contact the state, ask the state for the information. They have it. You can go right to a state database and look up a corporation, my corporation, and see who the shareholders are. It's right there. You know, it's this is not rocket surgery. Why do you have to make me do hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars worth of compliance to make it work? Yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous. So uh, we re recently changed banks, including moving our businesses over from one bank to another. We had to pull the corporate uh, incorporation papers and I pulled them off the state website and I just sent them over to the bank. The bank already has all this information and FinCEN regulates the banks. I mean, they could easily get access to this information. We know the agencies talk to each other. We know they squeeze the banks all the time. But I think it's just easier for them to set up a website and say comply or die. I mean, that's what it really what it comes down to. Otherwise, they got to otherwise they got to set up a system in the back, you know, in the back room where they actually talk to each other, and that's harder. <laughs> they were they already they're already they're already squeezing the banks at every opportunity. Operation choke point, credit card codes, all this other kind of they're already squeezing these guys. They got them by the testicles, and they're squeezing hard every day. And you're telling me they couldn't say, by the way, who owns these corporations? I mean, come on, that's insanity. This is punitive. I mean, that's all I could say. It's punitive. And that is just, it's horrific. All right. We're going to continue the discussion on this. And then the last segment, JD, will give a chance to kind of talk about whatever else we want to talk about here. Uh, here we go. We are uh, 10 seconds out. The Michael Duke show, common sense, liberty-based, free thinking radio, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the YouTube, you know, do it all. Just do, just do it. Here we go. Jump it back in right now. The Michael Duke Show. Not your daddy. Wait, sorry. Not your daddy? Ooh, not your daddy's talk radio. Huh. Whew. I was scared for a second. Thought we were going down. Here's Michael Dukes and the show. All right, J.D. Tuchilli is our guest. We're continuing now. He is with Reason Magazine, and we're talking about uh, something called the CTA, the Corporate Transparency Act, something that you have probably never heard of. But if you're a small business, an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp with less than 20 employees, any one of those three with less than 20 employees, you are now required by federal law to comply with that or face up to two years in prison and a $500 a day fine for failing to comply. Um, the, the crazy part about this, uh, J.D., is how this was all put together. Uh, and this is, again, goes back to my whole animosity towards, you know, these Christmas tree bills, these omnibus packages where they put together, you know, a multiple hundreds of hundreds of thousands of page bills. Oh, and they slip a few pages in there about one little thing that nobody's ever, it's never gets debated on the floor. It doesn't get talked about and it gets passed. Give us the genesis of this one. Oh, uh, this had floated around as this, as a freestanding bill for a couple of years called the Corporate Transparency Act. In order to, in fact, in order to find legible text on it, I had to look up the older versions of the bill because then it got buried in the National Defense um, Authorization Act of uh, 2021. I guess it was. Um, it was vetoed and then passed over the president's veto. It was vetoed by uh, President Trump at the time. Um, so it got passed. It was buried under a lot of verbiage. And I'll tell you right now, if you were to go to a me your member of Congress and say, why did you vote for this terrible uh, bill? Your, your member of Congress would say, I voted for what? Because they have no idea of, of most of what they're voting for. They voted up and down on these omnibus bills that have all sorts of stuff just stuck in there. And in this case, the NDAA, which is always a huge monster bill, had this grafted onto it, along with I don't know what other kind of horrific legislation was probably also stuck in there, no doubt stuck in there. And so the CDA passed as part of the NDAA, which is more uh, which is more often than not how legislation passes these days. So it got stuck on there and I'm sure it was reviewed by very few, if any, legislators who actually voted on it. Right. I mean, we're talking about this is a 1500, 1600 page bill. And they put 20 pages in there about the CTA somewhere buried in the middle of it. And, and could, could you, you, like you said, you had to go back to the original language of the original standalone bills. Did they, I mean, is this like so obfuscated in there? You couldn't even, you couldn't even figure it out from the NDAA itself. 
Oh, yeah. Well, it's justified. Remember, NDA, National Defense Authorization Act. So the language it's stuck in about is all about national security. And it was justified originally as national security fighting against terrorism. So you, you get it's buried in there in, in language about fighting money laundering by terrorists. Now, what it actually does is squeeze small businesses, but it's justified in there with the bill broken up into chunks, you know, it's stuck in there. It's awful. <laughs> and it's and it's impossible to figure out what it does unless you know the genesis of the original legislation. <laughs> and as we all know from watching Matlock, ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? But the thing is, they they don't tell you. They don't. I mean, oh, we posted it on the National Register. How many small businesses are taking the time out to read through the 90,000 pages of the National Register to figure out that that's what I mean? To even expect them to understand, this goes back to the uh, this goes back to the discussion on like the bump stock ban and some other things where the judges were like, "How are people supposed to know that what they have in their hands now is illegal if they're not paying close close attention?" You know, it's the same kind of thing. How are they supposed to know? How are small businesses, which are much more prevalent than bump stock owners, how are they supposed to know about this? Because fine sin, the Justice Department, whoever is ultimately in charge of this is not doing any education on this. You'll only know the first time you see the story about the small Etsy supplier who gets put in jail because they failed to disclose who their corporate owner is or who the main shareholder is in their corporation. That's what's that's where it's going to make the news at that point. Yeah, I mean, sometime in 2025 or 2026, some like a couple of business people are going to come forward with dunning letters from the federal government telling that they're in, in violation of a rule that they had no idea that existed. And the chances are, if, even if they have accountants, their accountants probably didn't know existed. And it's going to be a nightmare. And the federal government is going to apologize you know, left and right. But in the meanwhile, meantime, they'll have destroyed a couple of businesses and a couple of lives along with them. I mean, this happens all too often, federal legislation, right? And also with state level legislation, especially when it's ill considered, it's brutal in terms of its enforcement, it's not advertised. And then the penalties are draconian. They're always draconian. They always drop these ridiculous prison sentences in there and these high fines because they pretend that they're going after terrorists and they're actually going after cookie bakers or, um, or people who knit and sell stuff on the internet. Right. Jewelry makers on Etsy. I'm just doing this as a side hustle in my kitchen on the weekend. And now I've got to face the federal government because you didn't bother to look at my incorporation papers to see who the main shareholder is for a rule that I had no idea what was. This is just this is madness. It really is. And I've used that term. This is weak. This JD, this has been a week for me to use the term insanity and madness a lot uh, because there's a lot of things going on, but that's why I had to have you on. That's why I asked you to come on because going through this, it just infuriates me so much that here we are trying to do the best as honest law abiding citizens. We're trying to do the best that we can. And yet there's this Damoclean sword hanging over our heads at any moment that they can change the rules, they can put new things into effect that we have no idea about, and they can destroy your don't get out of don't get out of line. Don't be a radio talk show host that says something critical because if you have a corporation, obey. There could be a don't be a don't be a blogger or a journalist that says something that is critical of the federal government because if you have a corporation, oy vey, you could be in some serious trouble. Um, and <clears throat> that's the thing. Has there been any discussion on how they were supposed to um, you know, uh, uh, put this information out or put this, or, or is it just, we published it in the federal register. It's up to you, sweetheart. I mean, there has been no, there's been no discussion from the federal side. And in fact, when I went on the American Institute of CPAs, they've been calling on the, uh, the feds to hold off on this because the feds haven't, haven't publicized this. And the CPAs were saying, even if we take no position on the wisdom of the law, you know, in and of itself, you haven't told anybody. They're not going to comply because they don't know they have to comply. You have to make some effort to publicize this. And they, I mean, they've been putting out uh, press releases saying that. Now, of course, it's the American Institute of CPAs. I don't think anybody really reads press releases from accountants if they don't have to. I certainly don't. I mean, my own, like I said, my own accountant didn't uh, send out a notice until two days before Christmas. No one sends out a notice two days before Christmas and expects it to be read unless they realize that time is running out and they've got to get it out the door. And I think that's what happened with my accountant. I mean, you know, I'm not going to embarrass the guy. He's trying hard. But, I mean, this is a ridiculous rule. And I really think it's a result of two things. One is that there's always laziness in the federal government. And dealing with small businesses is harder to deal with you know, thousands of small businesses. 
is hard in, in dealing with a couple of big corporations who have compliance departments. You know who's on the other end of the phone. You call them up or send them an email and they say, oh, okay, I'll get right on that. Um, and also hostility to small businesses because they're hard to herd and they involve more work and you'd rather deal with a few big companies than a lot of small ones. And I think, I think between the hostility to small businesses and the laziness, you kind of hit this perfect storm that, that breeds these kind of uh, bills that are meant to squeeze people and force them into larger uh, conglomerates. This is kind of a companion legislation to that idea that was floated by uh, Biden originally, where he wanted to have anybody that made $600 cash over the Internet through PayPal or something. He wanted every transaction of $600 or more reported back to the IRS, which, again, goes back to them trying to inveigle themselves into every aspect of your life because they're not getting their fair share, essentially, is what they're saying on everything. And this is just kind of that same companion piece. Oh, it absolutely is. I mean, financial surveillance, the feds have been, and the government overall has been getting more and more um, upset about the idea that there's any kind of money flow beyond its reach and beyond its its, um, its eyesight. And they've been doing so for the years. And then part of that is because they don't like, you know, they're control freaks. Government is a magnet for control freaks. And also as the technology of surveillance advances, they realize they're getting closer and closer to monitoring everything and they want to give it a go. So in the past, they knew that a, a you know mostly cash economy of 100 years ago couldn't be monitored. That wasn't possible. Now that most things are electronic, you're getting close to the point where they can monitor virtually all uh, financial transactions and they want to be able to do that. And they don't want things occurring out of their view because they're control freaks. And I think that really explains an awful lot. I couldn't agree more. Now, this one judge has ruled against it for the NSBA, the National Small Business Association, and one single member. So a member of the NSBA and the organization came together, they sued, and the feds are saying, okay, fine, we won't, we won't, we won't enforce it with you. Uh, where does this go from here? I mean, there is there a bigger lawsuit? Is there, and this was, I'm assuming, at a district level somewhere, so it's in one district, or is this uh, something that's 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 larger? What what where does it go from here? Give me the timeline. This is in the Northern District of Alabama, so it's a district level federal judge. Um, it's it's as low a level in the federal courts as it can be. That means there's going to be appeals. It'll be appealed up to the uh, the appeals level, and from there, possibly to the Supreme Court. Depends on whether the feds back down and what and what's decided at the appeals level. So you're you're talking about given the federal court timeline. I don't know a couple of years before this as this works its way up the food chain. In the meantime, the feds claim that they have the right to enforce this against everybody who's not a member of the National Small Business Association. Probably as we're talking, the, the ranks, the membership ranks of that group are swelling. Um, I imagine that a lot of people are trying to buy themselves a little grace by joining it and paying it, paying annual dues. But uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, this is going to work with the food chain as the feds appeal. And they're certainly going to appeal because there's no way they want to just to have a law shot down at, at the district level and, and, uh, and just lie there. Um, they're, you know, especially when they're already claiming that they're going to enforce against everybody else. That in of itself, the enforcement is going to engender new lawsuits uh, and appeals to the court. Just a second. Sorry about that, JD. I just lost you there at the very end. I had an internet burp or something. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's going to be two years at this point, probably before anything comes about of this. Meanwhile, anybody who's not complied is liable. Now, maybe they won't go after him. I don't know. Do you want to risk that $500 a day and potentially two years in jail for not filling out the form? Um, I got to say, yeah, this is a very clever ploy by the NSBA. Hey, I've already got the website up right now in the background, nsba.biz. I'm going to find out what it's going to take to join because I'd rather spend 100 bucks a year or 200 bucks a year than not have to comply with this because that would be, I can tell you right now, that's much cheaper than having to hire an accountant or a lawyer to do the form for you. That's for sure. Uh, final thoughts on this bill, uh, J.D.? Um, this is part of the ongoing effort by the federal government, too. I mean, in addition to the other things, to kind of centralize everything. We talked about, I mean, I, I, 
I mentioned the control freakery. I think that's at the root of a lot of this. Um, this also takes something that traditionally has been state level regulation, regulated at different levels among different states. You know, some states are more uh, intrusive, some states are more hands off, and it tries to centralize at the federal level and make small businesses, the very smallest economic unit in our economy, report up the chain to the federal government, to the U.S. Tre Department of the Treasury, just bypassing the states entirely. So there's a lot here that that's, um, first of all, you know, it's not just inconvenient and dangerous for small businesses, but it changes the relationship of the government to the individual too. Right. It makes them report to D.C. and not to their local officials. This is about the centralization of power. That's what this is about. This is, I mean, this is exactly what, when Jefferson warned about consolidation of power, and he wrote about that 26 years after the four, after the signing of the, of the declaration of the, or the constitution and everything else, he wrote about this when they, when government consolidates unto itself, all this power, he was already writing about it 26 years, 26 years afterwards. And here we are 200 years later, and they're still just consolidating power unto themselves. All they can do. It's crazy stuff. J.D. Tuchilli is our guest, contributing editor, Reason Magazine. Uh, we're going to take the final segment, and we're going to we're going to talk about all the other things that J.D.'s writing about. He writes about so many, and it's so disparate. So, you know, one, it's great stuff, and we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, we'll be back with more. The Michael Duke Show, common sense, liberty based, free thinking radio. We return with J.D. Tuchilli right after this. We're broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Allowing all of these entities to provide streaming stuff going on, on, the, on the Internet. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. J.D. Tuchilli is our guest uh, from Reason Magazine. Tawny says, is this also a state's rights issue? Yes, that's what the judge said. The judge says this is already he mentions that in his ruling. They said this is also something that the state should already be doing. So it's not just a First and Fourth Amendment grounds thing. It's actually a Tenth Amendment ground thing as well, which I don't even think. I mean, the judge didn't even get to the First and Fourth Amendment issues as well. He brought up that Tenth Amendment issue right from the very beginning. You haven't given us a reason why there should be federal supremacy on this issue. Right, J.D.? That's exactly right. And he said the feds, you know, the Congress, when it uh, passed this law, didn't even hand wave its way to federal jurisdiction over something that's traditionally in, in the state's uh, dominion. States have this information. They collect it. That's because you incorporate it at the state level. You have to tell the state who's incorporating. And, uh, and so the states have this information. But it's also at the federal level because you have to tell your bank when you open a bank account. You have to turn that information over when they do their due diligence to figure out who is behind the business that you're opening it up with. So this consolidates at the federal level, but in, by invoking federal jurisdiction, that doesn't necessarily exist. They didn't explain where they got this jurisdiction from on something that has always been handled by the states in the past. I'm going to juris your diction right now is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and right there. Um, Tawny also asked, can Alaska do something about this on behalf of small business? Well, I'm assuming a state could sue the federal government uh, for basically overriding the state's supremacy on this issue, the state's authority on this, and take it as a Tenth Amendment issue as well, um, or at least join on any other, even maybe on this other bill, they could join, um, you know, amicus briefs or whatever on something like that. I mean, I would, I would hope that we would encourage our legislators to pick up something like this. This affects so many people. I mean, it's just, again, small business makes up, it's over 80%. It's like something like 86% of all businesses in America are small business, like sole proprietorships, one, two, three, four employees. That's the vast majority of businesses in this country. And that's who's affected by this. Oh, absolutely so. I mean, it's anybody who created an LLC or an S corporation or C corporation to do whatever kind of business. I mean, like I said, I've got a couple of them myself. We've got small businesses. We do a little commercial real estate. Um, other people just have a, you know, a, they're vending a stuff, a, you know, stuff for a side gig on Etsy or eBay, or they've got a, you know, they might have a retail storefront someplace. This is the smallest level of incorporated business you can have. You don't have a compliance department. You only may have an accountant or an attorney that you use on a regular basis because it might be that your, you know, your day to day business doesn't require that. So compliance with this new federal regulation is going to be extremely burdensome. And there's no good justification for doing this uh, except that 
they can. And, and, they, and there's not a lot we can do about it except file lawsuits in response. Right. No, it's uh, it's insane. It's, this is just absolutely insane. And the fact that they took no effort to inform the public of this rule and this law is is just a slap in the face is just a slap in the face to small. But like you said, they hate small business owners. Mm -hmm. They hate. I'm so I hate having to deal with you because you're so small and you don't do you don't make my job easy. Therefore, I hate you, which is we hear that a lot. I mean, I'm thinking I'm looking at you, FBI and all these other law enforcement agencies where we just need to make it easier where we could track these people down. Forget about their rights. We need to make it easier for us. It was intentionally supposed to be hard, but don't worry. You know, we'll make it easier for you. Uh, and like you said, the the occurrences of people with a sociopathy towards control freakery is, uh, I mean, government is a beacon for that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I, I remember when Obamacare passed, uh, you know, 12, 12 years ago, or longer than that at this point, um, Ezekiel Emanuel, who is the brother of Rahm Emanuel, the former, uh, you know, Obama aide and then the mayor of Chicago after that. But Ezekiel Emanuel is a physician and he helped to design Obamacare. And he wrote a paper saying that they wanted to force consolidation in medicine because it would be easier to enforce the principles of Obamacare, you know, its regulations, its new rules, its new structures across larger consolidated medical companies than across independent medical practices. I mean, it was just, that was the justification laid out for Obamacare. And you know, that's exactly the way the people, the IRS think, the people, the Treasury yep. Department think. Yep. I mean, all of these bureaucrats would much rather get on the phone and call a big company, talk to the compliance department to get stuff done than have to deal with a hundred small business people who don't even know what they're talking about and resent having to talk with a with a uh, government official ever this is the same thing i mean like vaping uh d drinking uh smoking this is behavior modification through taxation we don't believe that your behavior you know is good or we don't like it or whatever we're going to modify your behavior through this taxation so we're going to make it harder for you to you know smoke or drink or do whatever uh whatever it happens you know go out do whatever it is and we're just going to regulate it into non-existence or make it so expensive that it just doesn't matter behavior modification that's what they're looking for that's that's ultimately ultimately it's about control that's what it's about there all right jd um i i'll i'll just peruse through a few of your articles here you could tell me what you're working on next and we'll just kind of take a little bit of a lighter side. Uh, we could talk about Utah, speaking of states' rights, since you wrote about that recently. That was a great uh, That was a great piece as well. Uh, we're going to jump back into it. J.D. Tuchilli, our guest. Maybe it's a new Western sagebrush rebellion. God, a guy could dream, couldn't he? He could dream. Here we go. Jumping back into it right now. The Michael Duke Show. Seriously humorous with a pinch of intellect. <laughs> Pinch of intel. Sorry, that is humorous. Here's Michael Dukes. Well, I mean, come on. It's a pinch. Just depends on how big your hands are. Uh, all right. We're going to continue on here. J.D. Tuchilli is our guest. Reason Magazine. Uh, if you are not subscribed to J.D.'s newsletter called The Rattler, um, you, you're dead to me. I mean, well, not literally, but come on. I mean, just it's, it's simple. It's easy. It's always uh, some something good. Um, he, we were just talking about this new CTA that Feinstein has put in, Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, you've got uh, a report on the Supreme Court, uh, you know, gutting social media laws. We've got the feds targeting, uh, you know, uh, journalists. You've got this latest, since we were talking about states' rights, in part over the CTA, you've got this latest piece that you've written here just about 10 days ago talking about Utah. I was saying, is this the beginning of a new sagebrush rebellion? For those of you who don't know what that is, go Google it. This, I mean, is this it, a Western state sagebrush rebellion? Utah just told the uh, feds to go pound sand, which, by God, I wish more states would do that. Uh, give, us a, give us a rundown on that and whatever else you're working on, J.D., I'll give you the floor. How about that? Absolutely. Uh, with this, the uh, Sovereignty Act, which Utah passed, which the governor there signed, basically says that um, if the feds pass a law, let's, you know, it might be something involving taxation or firearms or whatever it might be, um, and the Utah thinks it's uh, bad law um, or, or, you know, it violates uh, Utah sovereignty, Utah by the Utah legislature can vote to forbid any state uh, or local 
officials in the state of Utah to help the feds enforce that law. Um, there was some protest this involves that this violates, uh, you know, uh, federal uh, you know, supremacy that you, that uh, you can't, Utah can't do this. The people who protested are wrong. Utah can do this. This is the basis of those um, immigration sanctuaries and cities around the country. This is the basis of Second Amendment sanctuaries around the country. It builds on something called anti-commandeering doctrine, which because we have a federal system, the federal government has overall authority in area of its jurisdiction, but the states have independent sovereignty and they do not have to use any resources at all to help the feds enforce federal laws. They may not interfere. They can't uh, go out and arrest, say, uh, you know, DEA agents or immigration agents, but they don't have to lend a helping hand or spend a dime to assist the federal government in any way. So Utah is on good, solid legal ground with the Sovereignty Act, and they're building on the prior uh, examples from the uh, sanctuary cities and from Second Amendment sanctuaries. Right, which is really, I mean, that's that's the basis for sanctuary cities were the first thing we heard about. And, of course, it's amazing how these people are all about states' rights when it's about an issue that they care about. Yet when it gets to Second Amendment sanctuaries, now all of a sudden they're against it again and we've got to listen to the federal government. But, I mean, people, the, the, the dichotomous thinking amongst people is just amazing sometimes. But this is, again, just another example of how states are starting to push back. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to see more and more of this. We now have a Supreme Court that I think is more friendly to that doctrine. Uh, and obviously some federal judges, some district judges who are friendly to that doctrine to say the states do have sovereignty in these issues. You can't keep overreaching. I mean, the 10th Amendment is there for a reason. The 10th Amendment was there and the framers were pretty smart about it. There's a reason why it's in that top 10 list is because it is super important and because they were afraid of the autonomy. Again, going back to Jefferson talking about the consolidation of power by a federal by a federal government, um, they knew that they had to put something in there so that the states always had their rights to say no at this point. Absolutely. And let's remember, the feds only have so many enforcers of their own. They largely rely upon state and local police to enforce federal law. Um, if states grow a backbone, uh, which might mean having to give up on some federal money, because that's how the federal government will punish them, is denying them grants and uh, you know, and uh, you know, streams of uh, financing. But if the, if the states have some backbone, they can simply say, you know what, this is a bad law. We disagree with it. We don't think it applies well to the people of our state. We're not going to help you enforce it. Go find somebody else to enforce it. We, want to give you any, we won't give you any assistance whatsoever. Um, and the states absolutely can do this. Uh, they have the they have the legal right to do it. They've done it in the past. It's something that they uh, the only way they they can be penalized is by withholding funds. But it's not right. illegal for states and localities to withhold assistance from the federal government. Well, and we know federal funds are the opium of the states, right? I mean, that's the opium. That's it's the first taste is free. That's what they give you. All this free, and it's you know, always the quote unquote free money, federal grants, federal funds, federal, uh, uh, you know, all this other kind of stuff. But if, first, the most offensive thing of that, of course, is it's your money that they're now using to coerce you to do things that they want you. It's behavior modification again, this time through giving you free money. And at some point, uh, Fairbanks is dealing with this right now with their air quality. The, they've been fighting with the EPA for 30 years over the air quality. And the EPA says, well, we just won't give you the highway funds for this non-attainment area. And, and some of us have always said, fine, the non-attainment area only has so many miles of road that you're going to give us highway funds for anyway. What is that? Three, $4 million? Do you know how much we've spent in compliance attempting to comply with this? multiples of that, 10, 20 times that over the course of 30 years. And we still can't reach attainment. So you know what? Keep your damn money. Uh, and I think you're going to see more and more states come to that. Uh, anyway, that's a great article. You should go read that as well. Um, JD, what else are you working on right now? We've got about three and a half minutes here. What, what's your what's your latest thing? What are you working on next you want to tease us with? Well, I heard you mentioning uh, get, you know, emergency get-home bags for your car. And that's funny because the piece I'm writing today, will publish tomorrow, um, is about the uh, growing uh, prepper movement in the United States, how it's becoming larger, more diverse, um, about 20 million Americans now can, can be considered uh, what, what the term is resilient citizens. Uh, they're prepared for about about a month 
of downtime in the case of emergencies. And that's much larger than it's been in the past. And it was spurred, of course, by the kind of the craziness of recent years, including the pandemic, including political polarization, people worrying that things are just kind of coming apart at the seams and that the powers that be um, might be uh, capable of, of messing with them, but not necessarily of helping them. And they might have to be, have to be in a position to do that themselves. So for those of you who are interested in that emergency bag piece uh, segment you, what you're talking about, Dylan, uh, that prepping piece will be up tomorrow. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You know, it's funny, JD, we talked about this on the show and I've had, I've had, uh, uh, you know, shows where I've done this throughout the last 24 years because I was born and raised in the middle of Alaska, right? I didn't know what a prepper was. I just knew that my grandmother at the age of almost 80 in her small little condo apartment that she lived in, you'd open up the pantry and there was five weeks worth of food in there. Why? Well, she was a gold miner's daughter. Their idea of going to the store was taking a sledge, you know, down into town for taking five days to get there to pick up enough food for another six months. It was just, to me, it was just, that's how you lived. You had food storage, you had this, you had a generator, you had some of this stuff because you just never knew. I didn't know it was called prepping. I just knew it was called being ready in case something happened. And now, of course, it's, oh, the doomsday preppers. And what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for the collapse of global society. No, I'm waiting for an earthquake or a snow storm that takes out all the power lines or some kind of natural disaster or some kind of solar flare or something else that, you know, and that's the thing you get looked at sideways, but that's usually just from sheeple who have never thought beyond their next meal, or they go to the grocery store seven times a week because they can't be bothered to plan out something long enough to be able to eat out of their own homes for, you know, by the, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but as you said, it's becoming not just a movement of a uh, fringe of the fringe. Now it's become a lot more mainstream. Oh, absolutely. And, and what was interesting is that the the, the biggest um, disaster that uh, was reported, at, you know, by a largest number of people was volcanoes. And they're like volcanoes. Why would they say that? Well, the people who are saying that are Pacific Islanders and Hawaiians. Um, they have volcanoes. They actually have a reason to be afraid of volcanoes. That's what's on people's radar. So this is a practical thing. And uh, the the need and ability to respond to emergencies is reaching a larger segment of the population. So it's definitely yeah. something that is becoming more mainstream stream and it's also necessary we got a lot of volcanoes here uh in the aleutian islands they spew up tons of ash and everything else but for all those people who think that nothing like that could ever happen in the lower 48 i've got two words for you yellowstone caldera okay i'm just saying you know that you know that you know that's just one thing alone but i'm looking forward to reading that uh, because i think more more people need to consider like i said we get complacent you know, we we live in a harsh environment. We drive back and forth all the time, hundreds of miles. Don't even think about it. Did we even put our boots in the car? Do we have, you know, it's just all these things. It's something that we need to think about. And I'm I'm really excited to hear that you are uh, working on that as well. JD, my friend, I, I'm grateful for you. I really am. You do a lot of good work. And uh, I just can't encourage people enough to subscribe to your newsletter to get all that. I just... I can't, I can't tell them enough that they need to go do that. I'm happy to see it on my email every day or every other day, whatever, however often it is you post. So, J.D., thank you so much for coming on board today. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Hold one line. Hold the, hold the line for just a second. All right, folks, we're out of time. Hour two, dead ahead. Open lines. What if? It's all, de- it's all coming up. Yeah. I mean, I had to laugh when the whole prepper movement started in the, well, it was like Y2K, you know, when everybody was freaking out about Y2K and I'm like, why is everybody freaking out? I mean, yeah, I got computers and, you know, and all that, but I mean, I got food, I got, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, why? And then, then I realized that it was becoming such a thing. And then you had the whole doomsday prepper thing on Nat Geo, people with three teeth and, you know, they got guns and they live in a bunker and they're like, this is, and I just, I'm like, I, I don't understand why is this such a such a ostrac you know ostracizing thing that somehow being prepared is anathema to most of the mainstream people they're just like oh well the government will take care of us I guess I I, I just don't know. I, I don't understand that attitude either. I mean, j- just being prepared for things that you think are real risks in your life. I mean. I lived in New York and during the 1977 blackout, the lights went out for uh, what, 36 hours. 
my father pulled out our camping gear and we and so and we you know took out our our uh, Coleman stove and our Coleman pump up lantern and we were fine and our neighbors were coming by and borrowing our stove I mean that's the way it was and I guess that's prepping and it is prepping um, but we were just able to respond to an unpleasant situation when things went bad and that's a good attitude to have to be able to do that to be reliant on yourself. I mean, really, that's what I mean. I like that whole idea of the resilient citizen. I like that phrase. I really like that ad, that that phrase. Uh, but it's it's self reliance. It's not waiting on, you know. I mean, why do you why do you have guns in your house, Mike? Why do you do that? Well, because if I called the state troopers right now, it would be at the soonest. It would be twenty five minutes for them to show up at the soonest, potentially an hour. Why do I have guns? Just in case. Why do I have fire extinguishers? Why do I have smoke detectors, right? Why do I have a little food, a little water? Why do I have Jenny? Why do I have, you know, just in case. That's that's the whole thing. It's just just in case. And uh, I always have find it, I always find it amazing when people kind of look down their nose or look at you askance. If you mention this, even just in passing, well, you've got food on your shelf, right? You've got, you know, you've got several weeks worth of food, don't you? What? No, no, I go to the store every other day. I go to the store every, I mean, there's people who do that every day on the way from the home. They, they pick up their groceries for dinner that night at the grocery store every day. And I'm like, first of all, who's got the time? Second of all, what happens? And we saw that during the pandemic when these store shelves were empty and people were freaking out. And it was because they had never considered beyond tomorrow. And it's exactly right. I mean, we had a garden going, we had our generator, we had food in the pantry, and we had friends are asking us, uh, where did you get whatever food item it was they couldn't find? And we were trading eggs with friends who kept chickens, and we were trading them our tomatoes. I mean, that's the way you should be able to respond to trouble, is to enjoy the good times, but be ready when the good times are interrupted, because they're always interrupted. Something does come down the road, and if you build no slack into your life, you're going to be caught up short when something does go wrong. Uh, that's exactly it. That's exa if you build up no slack. I like that. I like that phrase because you're right. If you have no give, if there's no margin for error in your own personal supply chain, you're going to have a real tough, have a real tough time if something goes on, whether it's an earthquake or the zombie apocalypse. I mean, either way, whatever it is, you're going to have a hard time for sure. Uh, JD, before I let you go, uh, what do you have? What's, what's, what's Arizona specific in your get home bag or your, uh, you know, what, what would you have that maybe somebody in Alaska wouldn't have in your get home bag or your car emergency kit? What do you have? Uh, we are big on water catchment and water filtration. So I've got barrels catching water from off my roof because water is a little hard to come by in the Arizona desert. So that's a big concern here. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, you we got we had to stay cool um, in the heat and then uh, you know warm at, at nighttime. But big uh, water is the biggest concern here, and so having those barrels catching the water from my drain spouts is a big one. Is the county is the county taxing you for your water that you're taking off your roof? I'm just thinking. Arizona encourages this. This is not Colorado where they give you a hard time about that kind of thing. It's funny how it varies from state to state. Is it ever, there's actually there's actually jurisdictions that will tax you for collecting rainwater. And putting it like using it in your garden or for potable water. It's just, it's insane. Whereas most people would go, well, that makes sense. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Can't do that. Well, good for you. Uh, we always include in our emergency kits, a candle. Um, and, and usually a candle that we probably built ourselves in like a peanut can. And that's to keep, if your car, if your car goes off the road in the middle of winter, you crack the windows and you light that little candle. You've probably taken a piece of cardboard, filled it with paraffin, and you let it burn, and it'll keep the car warm enough for you to survive inside with the windows cracked uh, until help can arrive or until you can get out. That's an Alaskan-based thing that will help you. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. You probably don't need that in, in Arizona, although it does get cold at night in the desert. But just probably not that cold. Yeah, not that cold. J.D., such a pleasure to talk with you, my friend. I always I always have a smile on my face when I'm done with you. I appreciate you coming on board. Uh, when are you guys coming to Alaska? You know, I want to go back. I haven't been since our honeymoon. And so we're, we're way overdue to visit. Well, when you do, you know who to call. We'll, uh, we'll have a good time together. So I appreciate we'll it. We'll do. Friend. Thanks so much for coming on board. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. You take care. All right, JD Two Chili, our guest, Reason Magazine. Um, it's insane. 
they're going to pass a law that affects millions of Americans, the majority of small businesses in the country, and they're not going to advertise that the law has been changed. They're just waiting to drop the proverbial hammer on you. And uh, that's supposed to be okay. That's supposed to be okay. So infuriating. Okay. Well, we're going to open up the phone lines. We're going to talk about lots of stuff. I think we're going to do some what if stuff too, as well. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio, Hour Two, Dead Ahead. Here we go. Put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. What more could you want from a low-budget radio program? This is a dumpster fire. That was just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show, streaming live across the world. i got to turn it on. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukesShow.com and across the state of Alaska. On this, your favorite radio station and or FM translator, plain old terrestrial radio. Uh, we uh, w- w- welcome you to the program. It's Thursday. Thursday. Only one day away from Firearms Friday. By the way, tomorrow on the program... Dr. John Lott will be joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking with him about a variety of topics, uh, but uh, it will it's always a it's always a fun time talking to Dr. Lott about that kind of stuff. And uh, it uh, it'll be uh, it'll be a good show tomorrow. I, guar- I guar- guarantee it. Uh, hour one of today's program, we just finished up with J.D. Tuchili from Reason Magazine uh, talking about the Corporate Transparency Act. If you're just joining us and you're a business owner and you've never heard of that, and I mean a small business owner, and you've never heard of that, you probably should go back and listen to the podcast on Spotify or wherever you find podcasts or go watch it on Facebook or YouTube because uh, it affects you. If you're a small corporation, an S Corp, a C Corp, or an LLC with less than 20 employees, we're talking about you. It's a new federal law that requires reporting to the federal government with penalties up to two years in prison and $500 a day fine if you don't comply. And nobody knows it. Nobody knows about it. Um, It's just, it's astonishing. So if you're a small business owner or you know someone who's a small business owner, ask them if they know what the CTA is, the Corporate Transparency Act, and uh, get on the stick. Get on the stick. Um, all right. What's coming up in this hour? Well, I got no guests for this hour. I do have some headlines that I want to get into talking about what's going on in the legislature. So we're going to do that first things first. And then because, um, I'm traveling today, uh, and I'm going to be on the highways. Uh, I was this last week, I was going back through my, uh, my, my get home bag, right? The, uh, my emergency bag that I keep in my car, just in case. Now I drive 120 miles a day whenever I commute uh, back and forth to Anchorage. It's like 120 miles. So I always have a bag uh, with me to just kind of keep, you know, in case I break down or something goes on. Uh, but it was time. It's, you know, we're coming up. I It's been a while since I got back in and unpacked everything, take a look at it, made sure I knew what I had. And uh, so I, uh, I did it again this last week. I spent a few hours over the course of the last week, you know, getting things, updating stuff, picking new things up, you know, changing, cleaning, doing all that kind of stuff. And so I thought it would be a good 
time to, uh, I thought it would be a good time to kind of go over uh, the basics of, uh, you know, kind of that get home bag idea. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to get into that and, uh, and get started. So uh, we'll do that here in just a little bit, right? And yes, it is a Mini Cooper. And yes, my car is enough to have an emergency bag because it's a backpack. I mean, it's not like you couldn't. It's amazing, actually, how much you can fit in a Mini Cooper. There, if you if you do it right, you can put a lot in a Mini Cooper. Uh, but it's just a backpack, and uh, it's enough that if I had to, it could keep me going. Uh, and keep me alive and keep me, uh, keep me safe, uh, for as long as it took me to either get out or get somebody out to me. So it's a, it's a good thing. And Jeannie says, I have a bag for winter and summer. Yeah, you should have a bag. And, and all I do for mine is I just take out the components that are winter specific and put in the components that are, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's what it is. So, um, so it will, uh, that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. And the phone lines are open. Uh, if you want to sound off on anything, I'll go ahead and throw the phone lines up right now. Uh, 907-433-3150. If you want to sound off and be part of it, 907-433-3150. Happy to, happy to do that. And uh, we will continue this discussions, right? It's all, it's all, it's all good. All right. So let's, let's take a look at what's going on. Well, we're, today's the day. Today is the day. SB 140. This is where the rubber is going to meet the road. This is where we see if Mike Dunleavy, if he, <laughs> we're going to see what kind of backbone he has. I was just going to say if he's got a pair, but we'll say if he's got a backbone, because he has threatened to veto SB 140 if he does not get uh, the things that he wants. Now, SB 140, of course, started out as a bill that was simply putting state monies, a state match to federal funds for increasing the internet speed in, in various rural communities. And, uh, <clears throat> it's, I got just got to say, um, I wouldn't even care if that bill passed or not, because again, the idea that we're going to be spending millions of dollars on, you know, physical fiber optic laying lines across the tundra for miles, when we could have just got everybody a Starlink and uh, done it for a fraction of the price with higher speeds and cheaper costs, I mean, what do I know, right? Uh, but SB 140 started out as that bill, and then, of course, it was Christmas treat up with a bunch of stuff, uh, and then eventually uh, was whittled back down, leaving us with a $600 increase to the BSA uh, and some other stuff. But the governor's threatened to veto it, and today is today is the day. Today is the last day the governor either uh, has to veto it or it could go into uh, it could go into law without his signature. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is that he then could later on come back and um, line item veto certain uh, parts of it to, uh, you know, is a, is a penalty, uh, according to the reporting in the ADN. Now I was originally told that because it is not a, uh, because it is not a, um, um, I, I've just, I totally just lost the word that I was looking for because it's not a bill that's specifically dealing with the finances. It's an appropriation. There we go. Whew, man, need a little, need to get, make, take my coenzyme Q10 to get my brain boost going on. Uh, because it's not an appropriations bill, he couldn't veto it. But according to the reporting that I'm reading right now, uh, he can uh, veto it uh, after it's gone into, uh, uh, after it's gone into law, he can go ahead and veto it and uh, uh, portions of it and make that, uh, uh, make that happen. Currently, there is no movement. There is no movement on any of this. In fact, the headline of the ADN and Sean McGuire with the ADN uh, reads, we don't have an agreement, quote unquote. All eyes are on Dunleavy on the eve of the education veto deadline. Today is the deadline for the 14th, uh, for March the 14th for that federal money. Now, as we talked with Mike Shower yesterday, uh, and I said, so what, we just lose it? He goes, oh no, it just, we have to reapply next year. So the money is still there. It's just coming. And I'll be honest with you, I would I would not be heartbroken if that bill got vetoed or just if, if, if they eliminated that out. Because, again, this idea 
that somehow the corporate cronyism of spending all these millions of dollars with different corporations, GCI, some of the North Slope telecoms and everything else, to build out this physical infrastructure seems, well, it seems wasteful to me, especially since, again, for $500, you can get a Starlink base unit, and for 90 bucks a month, you get half a gig of internet speed. Whereas as you look at some of the other, you know, you look at the telecoms, we talked about that email that I got a while back from one of the North Slope telecoms touting all their new plans and everything else. A com- they didn't even, first of all, they didn't even have a comparable plan to half a gig down, 500 megabytes down. I think their largest plan was 200 or 250 down, and it was $400 a month. And even though they also touted the fact that you could get federal offsets, meaning that the federal government would pay part of your bill, it was still twice as much as Starlink was for half the speed. And they had to run physical cable out to these places. So who who knows how long that was going to take. Yet you could have a Starlink unit at your place with the next mail drop and be set up and be ready to go. Um, So I don't know if I would be, I don't think I would be heartbroken if SB 140 was totally vetoed. Now, the governor has, again, until midnight tonight to sign or veto the bill, or it will automatically become law. He had threatened to veto the bill one day after it passed the legislature um, in, uh, because he wanted, he wanted these other two things, one being the teacher retention bonuses and the expansion of access to charter schools. Um, now it's been two weeks since he threatened that and none of the education priorities have moved out of either body. There are separate bills for each of those things. Um, but they are all basically both sitting in their respective committees and their respective bodies. Nothing is happening on that. Um, Will Akowski, the Anchorage Democrat, met with the governor on Monday and Tuesday trying to craft a good faith, a good faith education agreement and avoid a veto. And those negotiations, according to the ADN, were not successful. Uh, Will Akowski said yesterday, we don't have an agreement. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. Um, but there's, you know, you got to understand who the players are behind the scenes on this. And they pointed some of this stuff out that they are vehemently opposed to things like, for example, the charter school issue, even though Alaska charter schools are some of the best in the country, they show the most innovation, they get all this other kind of stuff. But you've got somebody like Gary Stevens, who's a former school board president, has been vocally and vehemently opposed to any change to the charter school system because they want the local control of it. They want the school board to have the say. And as we all know, school boards and school systems and education industry, they hate competition. So, you know, good luck getting a local charter school in if the local board is against it. Now, some boards do it and some, but we've also, again, I'm just looking back to Anchorage and that Lakeridge charter school that got disemboweled here recently, uh, which forced 800 students to pull out of the system entirely. They pulled out of the Anchorage school system in its entirety. Uh, obviously not listening to what the parents wanted because 800 of those students didn't go back into the school system after they closed that charter school. Um, he also, Willikowski also said that on a conference yesterday, a news conference, that creating civic, uh, significantly more charter schools in Alaska would require substantial conversations by legislators, including how school funding could be pulled away from neighborhood schools. A charter school is a neighborhood school. I just want to point that out. Right. Again, the government is trying to pick winners and losers here and they suck at it. But, you know, oh, how do how do we pull how do we get school fundings pulled away from neighborhood school? A charter school is a neighborhood school. And I would venture to say that charter school parents are more engaged than your average than your average school parent. And so it would seem like that would make sense if you want to do that. Uh, but anyway, um. So we have no idea what's going to what's going to go on during the press conference back in February. He Dunleavy signaled he was prepared to use his line item veto power to reduce education funding from the budget. Uh, So he may potentially 
reduce the BSA increase. I mean, we just don't know at this point what's going to happen. And we have until midnight. So all eyes are on the governor today to see where he's at, what he's doing, and where we go from here. But um, this this should be an interesting, interesting take. Now, there's some other, there, the, the uh, Alaska Beacon has uh, some other quotes in here that I kind of wanted to get to. Maybe we'll pick those up on the other side. Um, but we will, uh, we'll continue that on the other side and then we'll get to our what if segment. But again, phone lines are open. If you want to sound off on any of this, 907-433-3150, 907-433-3150, the Michael Duke show, common sense, liberty-based free thinking radio back with more after this. is that common sense regularly heard on american radio like michael duke show radio okay okay um Uh, let's go over here. Uh can't line item the money in a policy bill but you can veto it in money in the budget. So although he can't line item in, out of this bill specifically, when the budget shows up and it has this money for this policy in it, he can then line item veto it. I could, I could see that right there. Um, um, Dudley V will send a text. Um, um, can we get back to the merits of attempting to go on a date in a Mini Cooper? Yeah, I'd like the Mini Cooper is like a strap on roller skate or something. Um, Terry and I go to Homer. That's the car we take when we go to Homer. Uh, and I brought back a bunch of plants one time from the wagon wheel down there in Homer, uh, one year, plus all of our gear, plus our chairs, plus the, yeah. Uh, again, it's surprising how much you can get into a, uh, it's surprising how much you can get into a Mini Cooper. Um, uh, anyway, um, uh, I'm going through here. Compare. I'm opposed to the government competing in private industry. Yes, yes. Uh, Mike is going to Fairbanks to call the dog race. Yes, I'm going to Fairbanks for the Open North American Championships. I'm going to be calling the dog races uh, in Fairbanks on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then I will be traveling back on Monday, which is just another reminder. I forgot to send that email. I need to do that right now since I'm thinking about it because otherwise I will forget because I will be driving today. Um, um, so I got to send that email right now while I'm thinking about it because otherwise um, it will be a, it will be a hot mess. Um, so let me, uh, let me, let me, let me put this in right here. Um, come on. Oh, my computer is so slow today. I don't know if it's just be, being extra stupid or what, but it is so slow today. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, mini is a strap on skate. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the, you know, it's got, it's got 15, 13, 15 airbags in it. I saw a mini Cooper two ahead on, on the Seward highway going to Homer one time. There was another mini that had gotten into an accident. And they head on to a truck and they walked away. Um, it's a, it's surprise. It's, it's amazing how durable uh, those uh, and how it's good stuff. Uh, all right. Let me um, put these on here. Um, uh, I will be traveling Monday and uh, schedule alternate. Uh, programming. Uh, okay, that's it. Um, uh, okay, I cannot talk and type at the same time. That's my one. It's one thing I feel a little ashamed about is that I can't talk and type at the same time. Um, uh, it's just it's tough. Uh, returning uh, to the air on Tuesday. Okay, all right. There we go. All done. Email sent. I've been, I meant to send that a week ago. That's how, that's how busy it's been. Yeah. BMW engineers. Yeah. The car's made by BMW. Why are we talking about my Mini Cooper? I don't know. Oh, cause Carol brought it up. 
Anyway, I love that car. Love that car. You put you put uh, you put uh, Blizzax on it, and that damn thing will go just about anywhere. Okay. Um, yeah, daughter has a has a mini. Their family of three loves it. Yeah, it's a great little car. I don't. My kids have ridden in the back of it. Uh, my other one, my first one. Um, wow, half the comments are hidden. You all must being bad. I haven't hidden a single comment. Maybe Google, maybe YouTube or Facebook is hiding comments. Uh, but just click on the little thing that says show all comments and you can see them all. Um, I have 15, yes, I have 15 politicians in my, no show on Monday. Nope. I will be traveling on Monday. Um, there we go. Uh, that's it. I guess we're up against, I guess we, we, we made it to the end of the comments. Plus you guys heard me type my email. Plus, I mean, the podcast listeners got to be rolling their eyes at this point. I'm sorry, guys. That's how it works. Uh, okay, we're jumping back into it. Here we go. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio. Like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Let's get to it. Here we go. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back. Hour two of the Michael Duke show, Thursday edition. We're continuing ahead. And, um, I, I'm just going to do just final cleanup thoughts on what's going to happen today with SB 140. Um, some of the final comments on this, uh, the reporting on the Alaska beacon, they've got some, they've got some, some stuff laid out. Um, again, what to expect here is at stake is the far-reaching education bill that would substantially raise the formula for per-student funding, the, B the BSA. That's the $600 and change increase in the BSA for the first time since 2017, although it's not the – this is deceptive. It's not the first time it's been raised since 2017. I guess that it would be substantially is the key word there, substantially raise it. And it would increase the Internet speeds uh, that rural schools can afford. If Dunleavy does not sign or veto the bill by midnight tonight, it will become law without his signature. But he could later veto any funding to turn the policy change into reality in the next school year by striking funding with line item vetoes when he's presented with a budget. So they were right. Again, appropriations versus a policy bill. This is a policy bill. He can't line item veto any part of the policy bill. He can veto the whole bill. But he could let it go and then come back and strike it at the budget time. Um, Alaska lawmakers, of course, narrowly rejected the teacher bonuses and the change to charter school rules before they approved SB 140. And the policies have not resurfaced in any new bills or proposals or additions to existing legislation. The governor's bonus plan, which is SB 97 and House Bill 106, <clears throat> is still sitting in the committee's in uh, both bodies. So that's kind of where it sits right now. There was another comment that I thought was kind of interesting. They quote in the, in the article from the Alaska Beacon um, that Dunleavy's plan to bonus teachers, to give them bonuses, was summarily rejected before the Senate Education Committee. Uh, and they go on to quote, Juliana Armstrong retired from the Anchorage School District after a 40 year teaching career. She said she owns a home, has health insurance and can afford modest travel because of her pension. She seemed to take the bonus proposal as an insult, quote, giving out occasional bribes is treating educators like naive children. Look down at all the money in your hand. Don't look at the distance in your empty future. A lump sum payment is a lump of coal. You can't grow old depending on it. Uh, unquote. That's her quote. And to which I said, I was just reminded of our conversation with Sarah Montalbano on Monday. Uh, first things first, let me point out that Ms. Armstrong is a retired teacher. She's already 40 years, right? And as, as Sarah pointed out, many of the new teachers are not, I mean, they're millennials. They're Gen Z. They're, they have a completely different outlook 
on what a career, quote unquote, looks like. They don't look to go to one place to spend 40 years, you know, working or teaching in one place. They want different experiences. And so this might apply to them better because it may retain them a little bit longer in that position. The average, uh, what was it? The average millennial is going to go through something like 12 or 15 positions in their lifetime, different different, different jobs. It's not like it used to be. It, it, the, the paradigm has shifted. Uh, it's no longer... You go to work for a company for 20, 30, 40 years, and you retire from that same company that you worked for for 20 or 30, 40 years, and you retire. That's just not what, that's not what they expect these days. That is definitely not the expectation. Um, while the bonuses garnered vanishingly little support for the people who would get them in the capital, uh, get them in at the capital for the last two weeks, there were a couple teachers who do did want them. Samuel Abney, a music teacher from Anchorage, said teachers should take any kind of money they can get and cited the dire financial circumstances of his colleagues. I think any measure that we can possibly get from this governor to get any kind of money that we could, we possibly could from a Republican governor, he says, in this, <laughs> he had to mention a Republican governor, we should take it and not lick, lift, uh, look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, again, uh, we had the teaching staff. I mean, the, the working seven or eight months out of the year and making a minimum of $55,000 seems like a, not a, that bad a deal to me, but I'm not a teacher. You know, there have been plenty of times when I would have been happy to make $55,000 a year plus my retirement and my health care. Yeah. Uh, defined benefits or to mine contributions, retirement, I mean, and my health care. Yeah. I mean, I'd be down with that. And cause I could spend the other three months a year working on something else. Doing a side hustle. That's what it is. But anyway, so midnight tonight is the day. That's when everything's going to drop dead. And we don't know what's going to happen on it. We'll we'll have to see. Does the governor blink? Does he go through with the veto? Does he just quietly let it pass into law and then say he's going to veto it later? I don't know. The House put out their first budget draft, by the way, on Tuesday. Um, uh, uh, Tuesday? Yesterday? I guess it was yesterday. Um, and they're, they, they're just a starting point because they have to have the spring revenue forecast, which also came out yesterday. And now they're saying that the state is projected to see a $200 million boost from higher, higher oil prices, um, which, of course, they're immediately going to spend. Uh, so, I mean, good news. Government spending increased. They got more money. They spent more money. End of story. That's that's pretty much, that's it, baby. And they're locked into that 75-25 payout for the PFD. That's what they're, that's where they're at right now. So that's, that's kind of the news for today. That's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the news uh, for today. It's, it's, uh, it it, it gets to it. Okay. Um, Well, uh, what, what else do we want to talk about? I wanted to talk about, um, some basic what if kind of stuff, some preparedness. And as I said, at the top of the hour, I'm going to be traveling. Um, I'm going to be traveling this, uh, this week. I'm going to Fairbanks. So I'll be going back and forth, uh, driving back and forth because it just makes more sense to do that, uh, than it does to try and, uh, take the, take the airplane. And, um, so whenever I travel, I, I carry, you know, whenever I'm, I'm leaving the house or going back and forth, I always got a bag in the car that has some basic emergency stuff in it. And I thought I would ask you, uh, what you have, uh, in your bag and then just kind of discuss my thoughts on what, uh, is important in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, in a, in a get home bag or a car emergency kit, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I would love to hear what you guys have to say on that. Again, the phone lines are open at 433-3150. Um, but, you know, we just don't think about it. And I think one of the problems is I, I, we, I, we had the story the other day talking about the kids who were driving the Tesla that finally conked out down in Soldatna, lower or uh, lower Kenai Peninsula, somewhere in Nikiski or someplace, and how they had T-shirts on. And it was cold, and because the car was so dead, they couldn't even open the trunk, the frunk, the front trunk. They couldn't even open the frunk where their coats and stuff were because they didn't carry it in their car. And 
all this kind of stuff. And uh, it just made me think that, you know, we get really complacent. Um, uh, it, it's, it's human nature, right? It's just, it's just human nature that we at some point get kind of complacent about what's going on. And we drive back and forth without any real problems. And pretty soon you'll find yourself hopping into the car, um, you, you know, if, hopping into the car and, uh, driving someplace without even grabbing maybe a hat and gloves or having a set of boots in the car or an extra blanket or whatever it is. It's just, it's, it's, it is amazing to me that, cause I've been there, I've been there where I left my bag at home and then I got driving down the road and I thought, man, I didn't pick up my bag and you know, geez, I, I hope something doesn't happen. I hope, I hope I'm okay. I hope I stay in cell range. I hope there's no accidents. I hope I don't get stuck on the highway. You know, all these other things that are running through my mind because it's just easy. It's, you know, we have it so easy. We don't think anything about driving a 120 mile round trip. It's just a daily occurrence and we're not even thinking about it. And, um, you know, you just don't know how fast things can change. And then I'm reminded about, um, I'm reminded about the, the times, uh, when I've been traveling on the, for example, the Glen highway back and forth between Anchorage and, and Wasilla. And I'm reminded of the time that there was that fatal accident. Um, and the road was shut down for what, 15, 16 hours, something like that. I mean, it was bad. Tra tra traffic was backed up for miles and miles and people were stuck. And people were worried about running out of gas. They didn't have any water. Um, they were, you know, people missed their shifts. I mean, there was, it was packed, it was bumper to bumper traffic, four miles, and they had to sit there for hours. Um, and it's a, it, it, something like that can happen. It's a real deal. You know, we had that, what was it, that 36 car pile up on the Kinnick River Bridge here this winter? I don't know how long the highway was shut down for, but I imagine it was for quite a while. And what are you going to do? Do you always travel on the ragged edge for, you know, gasoline or anything else? Do you carry extra water? Do you carry uh, anything like that? So I've just been thinking it's so easy in this day and age to just get complacent, to just get, you know, oh, it'll never happen to me. Which, I mean, that's human nature. Again, uh, human nature is, that's why we have such a morbid fascination with this stuff. Because as we, you know, we look at an accident or something when we go by and we're so grateful that it wasn't us. But of course, we think it would never happen to us. We think it would never happen to us at all. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's a crazy thing. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to go through that. And we're going to talk about just a few of the things that I have in my bag um, that I carry with me at all times. Um, and like I said, I sometimes in the summer and winter, I change some things out. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty consistent kit, uh, for what I carry in my vehicle and, uh, you could too. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get into that and we're going to jump up, uh, and talk about that in the next segment. It's what if thought provoking, thought provoking Thursdays, right? Uh, thought provoking Thursdays. That's what we're, that's what we're all about here. All right. We're going to continue. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty Base, Free Thinking Radio. We return with more right after this. If you missed the show, you can listen to it on your time with Dukes On Demand. Oh, and it's free. Like America used to be. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay. Um, let's go over here and see what you guys have to say. Um, hopefully the governor will veto this, says Gary. Yes, yes. 
Um, let's see. Um, going through here. Uh, legislators focusing on the BSA isn't going to improve Alaska's education. Harold and I agree on that. He then said you should fly. It's safer. Um, I mean, I've done the math, uh, Harold, not on the safety issue because I'm not concerned about safety either way. Uh, but it's a time issue. It's a time issue and it's a convenience issue. And, um, it literally takes me from the time I left my house to go to the airport, to do the thing, to get on the plane, to get there, to get the rental car, to do all that kind of stuff. It literally is zero time saved, maybe 20 minutes saved by flying rather than driving. And I would just rather drive. Um, uh, Debbie says, I agree. We traveled uh, twice a week down to the Valley. We traveled in, we traveled, we traveled twice in a week. To, oh, I'm sorry. While she was here, she was here. We traveled twice in a week down to the Valley. We have a blanket, extra gloves, ear coverings, headbands, hand warmers, Scooby snacks, matches, and a small candle. That's a good start. Definitely a good start. You know? Um, Gail says my biggest fear is having to go potty and stuck for hours due to a train wreck. I mean, tiptoeing into the toolies is not an option. Well, it could be an option. Um, it, it could be an option. Um, if you have the necessary accoutrement to take care of it, right? Jeannie says car kits, necessary fluids, a hundred piece toolkit, including electrical connectors, blankets, charge, change of clothes, tarp, bicycle stick. Uh, she met a baby stick and a lighter. Yeah. Uh, Harold says, was there a crash Mini Cooper holding up traffic? No, there wasn't. Um, honey bucket and a tarp. I'm not going to carry a honey bucket around with me, uh, but I do carry a little piece of tarp with me. I mean, it just folds up. And this is, this is really the thing. Driving a Mini Cooper to Fairbanks in the spring. Who does that? Is this really done? Well, yeah, it is. This is a lot. I mean, are you afraid to drive in Alaska? Maybe you need to put a little more, maybe you need to put a little more clock mileage on your car if you're afraid to drive. Um, this is Terry. Terry, this is the, this is the, this is the conundrum of every parent. Taught my kids to be prepared for traveling the winter. You could teach them, but you can't make them do it. If they were still teenagers, they wouldn't be driving because they get it. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. That, you know, you could teach them, but they still don't, you know. Um, single burner blazo fired stove was sure a nice thing to have. And couscous can be cooked in five minutes. I have a jet boil stove. I don't carry it with me anymore. Um, I do have a little hexamine tab and a little, little tiny fold of stove with a hexamine tab in it. I mean, it's, you know, takes up this, it's the size of a cell phone by the time you fold everything up. And that's, you know, just in case you ever needed to do that. I can't imagine a situation where I would, but you never know, you know? Um, where is the show all comments button? I don't know. Uh, but there is, I know when I go back and look at the show afterwards on Facebook, that it's only showing, so like, it's usually set to only showing relevant comments, which I'm like, how do you decide what's a relevant comment or not? Anyway, it should be there. Um, you could put a lot of things in a honey bucket. Well, true. I mean, I suppose you could put a lot of things in a honey bucket, but it's awkward. I don't know. I don't, I don't really need a bucket. If I had to go do the business, I guess we'd just go do it and uh, get it done. Okay. Um, that's it. I'm all caught up. I'm all caught up. Unless Randy wants to give me his PFD and I'll take it back with me. That's what Harold says. He wants me to go pick up Randy's PFD. Pick it up. <laughs> I don't think Randy would be amused. Um, all pop-ups only pop, all comments only pop up after the show is over. Facebook is weird. All right, there you go. Fetch water from a creek for your overheated Cooper. Well, I do have some bottles. I do have bottles. If I needed to do that, I could. Um, but a bucket is just awkward uh, for me personally. I don't, there, again, it's, it is a mini Cooper. There's not unlimited room. And I hate stuff rolling around in the car. So I just, I don't do that. But I do have some bottles. Um, including a one gallon jug of water that's about two thirds full, uh, which means that it's frozen sometimes and sometimes it's not, but I have it there as well. 
And Brian keeps telling me the speed limit is 25 miles on Sunset Drive. I don't know what that is. You've said that like three or four days in a row, Brian. I have no idea what that means. Is it a line from a song? Is it some clever thing that I just don't get? I don't know. Um, there you go. <laughs> wow. I don't know if that's mean or just ignorant, Harold. You weigh more than a Mini Cooper. Let's get serious about safety here. Um, that Mini Cooper weighs more than most SUVs. So I, you know, I think you'd be surprised. The Michael Duke Show, proudly splitting the left versus right uh, dichotomy. Yeah, I had to look that word up too. I don't think it means what he thinks it means. There he is though, that guy, Michael Dukes, the one with the show. All right, welcome back to the program. It is the Michael Duke Show, common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Hello, my friends. Hello. How you doing? Welcome back to the uh, welcome back to the show. It's the final segment uh, for today, and we are ready to uh, get into it and uh, and 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 get all things done. Get it all squared away. Uh, we're talking about um, preparedness. We're talking about emergency kits. Uh, it's the what if segment of the show today. Um, and we're going to, uh, go over this. This all came out of the fact that again, I'm going to be traveling and I was just kind of reviewing my emergency b uh, bag for my car and what did I want to have in there and what was I changing out and did I, you know, like, make sure the batteries are fresh and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I thought I would just say, if you're going to go on a trip, um, you know, you can, this is a good opportunity to, this is a good opportunity to kind of check things out and, uh, and make sure that you will get where to your destination safely. If doesn't matter what happens. Uh, and so we're going to start there now in a vehicle, it's, uh, you know, pretty simple and easy. You've got a vehicle, no matter how big or how small in my case, um, you probably should have a blanket folded up. If you want to be super sneaky about it and, and, and get it, save as much space as possible, you can put it in a vacuum bag or one of those space bags or whatever. You could crush it down and put it in there knowing that you just had to cut the bag open to get it out. I mean, you could do that or just fold a blanket and put it in the back. Um, I, in my Jeep, uh, I always have a, I've got like a, one of those big, long rectangular milk crates that's got some basic fluids in it. Uh, a few tools, toe down, tie down straps. And on top of it is sitting is a blanket. That's a simple, that's a simple thing. A blank, just having a blanket in your car could mean the difference. If you had nothing else, that could mean the difference between life and death in a situation in Alaska in the winter. If you slid off the road or whatever, having that blanket could save your life. Now, again, you know, winter time, you know, do you have gloves? Do you have a hat? Do you have a pair of boots? Do you have an extra hat and gloves? Uh, I have a pair of hat. I have a, I have a gloves and a hat in my backpack that I carry with me. I also have another set of hats and gloves stuffed into my boots with a pair of wool socks just in case I need to use them. I mean, because it doesn't take up any more room. The boots are just sitting there in the back of the car. So why not stuff a, a, a pair of socks and another hat and glove combo into the bag or into the, into the boot? It doesn't take up any more room. I mean, that's pretty simple and easy, right? But how many times have you driven around without a, a colder coat? I mean, maybe you got a light. I walk around all the time in shirt sleeves, uh, even, even when I'm now I have two sweaters and a coat in my car, right? I have two sweaters, a coat in my car. Um, in case it gets cold or whatever, I just go back there and I throw, I observed an accident on the road here a couple, three weeks ago. Uh, I was, it was right, it happened right in front of me. And so I pulled over to make sure the driver was okay and everything else. And then the trooper showed up and he said, can you please wait? I need to get your statement. And, uh, I'm standing around outside in my shirt sleeves and I'm like, okay. And I just went to the back of my car, pulled out my sweater, put it on, voila, presto changeo. I'm, I'm nice and warm. 
Um, I mean, this is, this is simple stuff, right? But it is important. And we get so complacent that we forget about the simple things of boots, hats, coats, an extra, an extra sweater or a sweatshirt. Layers are important. You know, maybe something for your neck. I mean, I'm always wearing a, a scarf or shamog of some kind, but you could have a scarf, a knitted scarf, or a neck gaiter if you needed to. Uh, what else do you carry in your car? We were talking with JD to Chili um, from Reason Magazine in the last hour and during the break, because his next article is actually going to be about preparedness, uh, which I found that was two great minds think alike, I guess. Um, and I asked him, uh, you know, what is something that is uniquely What is something unique in preparedness for Arizona folks, you know, for something, tell us something that, you know, and for him, it was water. Of course, they live in the desert, right? So he says water can be hard to come by. So they have a full catchment system on their roof where they catch all the rainwater that hits their roof and they catch it in drums and they utilize that for their water storage. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, So do you have water in your vehicle or in your bag? Um, and that's, or do you have a way to make water or, uh, 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 to filter water? I guess I should say not make water. I can make water all day. Uh, do you have a way to filter water, whether it's through water filtration tablets, which trust me, oh, it's just so horrible. Uh, you don't want to drink that's it just tastes like dew. Okay. You don't want to use water tablets or do you have a small inline water filter or something like that, that you could, if you needed to, you know, get water from some local source that you were not sure of. I always carry a full water bottle with me and I have a one gallon, one of those square, I don't know, Arrowhead, whatever the brand is from Fred Meyer, one of those square jugs of water in my car. That's about two thirds full. I keep it up uh, near my heater. And uh, so like right now it's, it's, it's about half of it is, un, is frozen and half of it isn't. Um, so I can always use it or I can heat it up if I need to. I've always got some water in the summer. I got water, water for days. Water is what you need for sure. But do you just have a water bottle in your bag? You should have a full water bottle. Everybody should carry like a Nalgene or what's nice about those Stanley style or whatever the brand name is, is that they, um, if you fill it with water, it takes a lot longer for it to freeze than it does in like a plastic bottle. So I have a thermos. I have one of the, you know, Stanley type thermal water, water bottles. So if it could stay outside overnight at 20 degrees and it still wouldn't freeze the water inside of it, um, it would hold it, uh, about 12 or 15 hours without freezing at, at, at below freezing temperatures. Uh, so having water is important. Um, do you need food? Eh, maybe. I mean, I, I've got a couple of food bars in my thing and I think I have a, uh, I have a, uh, lifeboat ration one of those 3000 calorie lifeboat rations, which doesn't take up very much room. It's the size of a small cell phone or a a double thick cell phone or something. They don't taste real good, but if you needed it, you could do it. But you know, a couple food bars, something like that, couple, a couple high energy, high, high calorie, uh, you know, food bars or granola bars or whatever. Um, the Luna bars, those are things you could keep in there, but you don't need a full, you're just going home, right? It's not like you're trying to survive in the wilderness. Um, what else do you need? Well, a basic first aid kit wouldn't be bad, but we like to call a boo-boo kit, a boo-boo kit. Uh, and so maybe, maybe you've got like an IFAC, which is a IFAC is individual first aid kit, right? That's the big first aid kit. That's got everything from the, uh, sutures to, uh, you know, to, to, to patches for gaping chest wounds, to uh, tourniquets, to all these, you know, I mean, that's a major first aid kit, right? Well, you got those, but what about just, you know, you cut your finger. Minor boo-boos that could become a major inconvenience down the road if you're having to trek or track. Do you have any mole skin in your bag or duct tape to, uh, if you get a, a blister on your foot from walking because you had to walk 15 miles home? Uh, because your car went off the road or whatever, and there's nobody out there. Do you have a little mole skin or something to be able to cover your blisters or duct tape will work a little bit of gorilla tape or something in that. Um, so yeah, so we've got, uh, so we've got that a first aid kit and it's just, you know, antibiotic ointment, maybe a little packets. You can go to the, you can go to the safety store, some of these safety stores, or you can go on Amazon and you could buy these little individual packets, painkillers, Imodium, Oh my God. If you don't have a modium, you go, this, 
trust me, especially if you're drinking water without a filter that you don't know the source of, Imodium. Just a couple of tablets of Imodium, just in case, right? You got maybe some Benadryl. You got uh, some ibuprofen, some acetaminophen. You've got the little trippy antibiotic point, the little packets, the little squeeze packets of antibiotic ointment. You got some Band-Aids. That's a boo-boo kit. That's it. Then you got your major first aid kit, which I have both. I have a boo-boo kit and a first aid kit just because, just in case. Um, And again, in Alaska, how about light? Do you have light or a way to make light? Well, I carry a flashlight on me. In fact, I carry two flashlights on me, a little tiny mini one and then one on my on my belt. Um, But I've also got an even bigger flashlight in my bag. Plus, I've got batteries for all of them because that you need batteries for all of them. So I've got a half a dozen batteries. Most of them take the same battery. So I've got a half a dozen batteries and they all fit the same flashlight. So it's all good. Um, do you have a little radio, a little portable radio? I got a little portable radio. It's a little teeny tiny thing. It's not great, kind of crappy, but it'll do the job if I need to tune in for, you know, an alert or something that's going on. Um, and some basic and some basic tools, ways to make fire. And that includes, yes, a lighter. I'm not just talking about going bear grills here where I have to use a bow and a and a, a wood a bow and a and a, and you know bow my way into a brand new fire. I've got a lighter, I've got matches, and I got a fire steel, all in one little package, all little waterproof package, just in case. You know, this all fits in a little teeny tiny backpack. And if you've got it with compartments inside where they, you know, got little pouches and things. I've got plenty of room. In fact, it's the pack that I travel with. I've already packed my clothes in it for the weekend. So it's got everything plus my clothes in it. Uh, Just there. So you got flashlights. I also got a headlamp. I got a headlamp and uh, flashlights in there as well. Uh, And finally, um, and I got a little roll of Gorilla Gaffers tape in there, little tiny one uh, that I can use if I need that. Um, And uh, it just, it makes it, makes it simple and, uh, and easy to do. Uh, so what do I got? I got light, I got thing, I got food, uh, I got heat, I got fire. If I need fire, um, I always have an extra pair of socks. I've got a couple extra pairs of socks and underwear, especially if you're walking, you definitely need socks. And I've got those in a Ziploc baggie that I've squeezed down, squeezed all the air out of. So it's airtight, uh, just in case. Um, and you might want to have, I also have one of those big trash bags, you know, that you get from cleanup, right? You get from like cleanup day, those big thick mill trash bags. I've got one of those folded up into a little small square, uh, because I can either turn it into a rain poncho if I need, or if, even if I just need to put the bag in a bag to keep everything dry, I can do that as well. So a big trash bag and a small piece of tarp. And I think I got it. I've got a, uh, I've also got one of those reflective blankets in there if you need it, but I mean, that takes up the size of a credit card. It doesn't take up any room. So that's about it. Um, do not leave the batteries in your stored electronics. Nope. Don't do that. I did that. I actually, that's one of the reasons why I took it apart is because my headlamp, the batteries in my headlamp had been there for a year and, uh, they had just started to corrode. So I had to clean all that up and get that all clean. So don't do that as well. I think that's, I think that's everything. That's, that's the whole thing right now. Anyway, we got to go. We got to uh, continue on tomorrow. It's Firearms Friday. John Lott will be our guest, Dr. John Lott. And we will see you then. Appreciate you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Okay. Candles. I forgot to mention the candle. Uh, I mentioned the candle to John Lott, but uh, I was, or to uh, JD2 Chili. Um, sleeping bag, extra shoes. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah. Socks and underwear. They don't take up any room and you definitely need the socks. Um, Brian, I guess Brian's telling me it's 25 on Sunset Drive and I'm speeding on Sunset. I don't even drive on Sunset. Where is Sunset? I don't drive on Sunset. I don't know where that road is. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. There you go. Uh, Anyway, bear spray. Yeah. 
bear spray, or you're 45. I mean, one of the two. It's, of course, I carry that anyway, so it just doesn't matter. Uh, all right. Well, we'll make a full list. Maybe we'll do another show on this and do the full list as we go, go through. All right, my friends. Well, that's it for toilet paper. That was the other thing I forgot. Toilet paper and wet wipes. See, I should have written that down. Brian says he sees my mini KGB. I don't drive. I drive on KGB, but I don't drive on Sunset. I don't even know where Sunset is. Anyway, make a note, man. Make a note. All right, we got to go. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free thinking radio. We will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day.